You're listening to the Allied Health Financial Podcast, evidence-based finance education for allied health professionals. Good morning and welcome back to the Allied Health Financial Podcast. My name is Giacomo. As always, I've got my good friend Ryan with me. How are you doing this morning, Ryan? Good morning, bud. How's it going? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You know, we've uh, we've talked a few times about having, you know, the one and only Emma Jack press play physio back on the podcast. We've said it, you know, to each other. We've said it publicly multiple times on the podcast. And today we have her back. It's pre-recorded, but we're going to embrace it. We're going to take it. We always love having her energy on here. So we've got a question period today from Emma Jack. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely take what we can get, and it's it's great to hear a voice on the podcast once again. Let's take a listen to the question. Hey guys, I have a request. I talk to women all day long, and something that inevitably comes up is parental leave. Women in healthcare, especially, are concerned with how to continue within their careers or run their businesses while still taking what feels good for them in terms of a parental leave and how to prepare for it. So I would love to hear any or all advice you have on this topic. It would be so, so helpful. Thanks so much. Emma, that's a great question. And it's a really important topic because uh, Giacomo and I have definitely talked at length about how the maternity leave definitely takes a lot of some top level talent out of the private sector and into the public sector because it would give you the additional benefit on top of employment insurance that would be given to you by the company or the hospital or the sector that you're working through. So we want to keep our top talent, especially our top female talent in the private sector. And this is a great question because we're going to be able to talk through a lot of these things that will help do that. Now, you're definitely talking about a another genre, maybe even people who run their own business. So that's going to be really important as well. Definitely. And we, you know, we love our friends in the public sector and we always want clinicians to work in the place that make them, you know, happiest. But it's always, it's unfortunate when people have to leave a job that they love in order to get all the, you know, the, to have the financial side of things figured out. So you're right, Ryan, and you and I have talked at length. It's one of the main reasons I feel like we really started All at Health Financial was to make sure that people were covered in, in this respect. Um, and I'm excited to talk about it more today. Before we really get into the nitty gritty of it today, we're pretty much going on a, a high level coverage here of three previous posts that we've done. So we're going to link to them in the show notes. Uh, make sure that you take a good read of those blog posts, listen to the podcasts. If you have any questions, drop us a line. But if, you, if you're if you looking for more information after what we talk about today, go check those out in the show notes and you'll have more information there. And we're definitely not going to pretend like we're experts on how to balance kind of work life. Now, Giacomo, you do have a newborn you may actually be an expert on how to balance kind of the work life as well. But in terms of making the time and being able to balance both of those things, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to set yourself up so that you can eliminate as much of the stress, especially the financial stress as possible, so that you can make the best balance that's right for you. Definitely. And I can't I can't call myself an expert in, in any of that. I have to Give all the credit there to my beautiful wife, who I will make sure listens to this podcast so she can hear that comment. But um, it's definitely one of those things that if you set yourself up in the best way possible, then you're covered. You know, a lot of clinicians might go into parental leave and think, you know what, I'm going to stay at home for X number of months, and then I'm getting right back into the clinic. And for clinic owners, that might be a harsh reality. It might be what they want to do, but you want to have the option in case it's not actually the ideal. You want to be able to say, you know what, I'd rather stay home for 18 months with my child. You want to make sure that financially you have that option, no problem. So what we're going to talk about today is really making sure that you have all of those bases covered, and then you can really tailor it to yourself because the cheesy line is still the cheesy line, but it's true. Personal finance is nothing but personal. Very, very true. We've said it many times. So why don't we start with how much you should save for a parental leave. And I think the first thing you have to do is decide, okay, do I want a 12-month or do I want an 18-month leave? Definitely. And 
This is really dependent on what you want to do and takes into account whether you want to go with EI or not, which we will talk about in a little bit as well. EI will either cover you for 12 months or 18 months, but if you don't go the EI route, and realistically, even if you do go the EI route, you can choose to go shorter or longer. So it's one of those things that 12 or 18 months is kind of arbitrary based on EI, but those are the numbers you're going to use. Once you have that timeline figured out or your, your ideal timeline figured out, let's say, you're going to clarify your fixed expenses. Now, going back to our budgeting 101, your fixed expenses are expenses that stay the same. So things like your mortgage, your vehicle payments, those sorts of things. And most of them will likely not change, whether you're on parental leave or not. So your mortgage, not going to change. Your vehicle payment, probably not going to change. Disability, critical illness insurance, likely won't change those sorts of things what's likely going to change are things like your professional fees because you should be able to get a reduced membership now that may only be true if you're taking a year so you'd have to look into that whether it's a few months your life insurance will probably change it's hopefully going to go up or you might even just be purchasing life insurance for the first time your vehicle insurance may actually go down because if you're not driving to and from work every day you can actually call your car insurance company and tell them that they'll likely lower your premium and you may not need liability insurance for you know that period of time so you may get rid of that once you're done estimating your fixed expenses now you want to check on your new variable expenses so many of those costs will drop as well these are the commuting costs as previously mentioned food beverages and stuff associated with work maybe a little bit of time out on the town hopefully not too much, but definitely a little bit as your lifestyle changes. And then you want to budget for some new activities, exercise classes and others. You still need to live your life, but a lot of those things are going to change as well. So setting out that budgeting aspect of it, fixed and variable expenses, steps kind of two and three. And if you're looking for a really handy way to get that covered even before this whole process, download the financial toolkit. The financial planner is awesome. We built it, but we still think it's awesome. Um, it's a really great place to start. Now to add on to that, you're going to have to budget for your new family member. So things to think about are diapers, wipes, food, formula, toys, clothes, childcare, potentially an RSP contribution. There's a lot of stuff to think about. I swore when our daughter was born that I was going to keep track of every penny that we spent on her just to figure it out. And I then realized that you can barely keep track of anything with a newborn. So I don't have that number for you guys, unfortunately, but there is some research that was performed by the Fraser Institute. They suggest that there's an additional cost. And these are the words of adequately providing for a child's needs at the basic levels in the range of about $2,500 to $4,000 per child per year. So try to figure out your best estimate. Are you buying hypoallergenic diapers? Are you, are you not? You really need to kind of find your best estimate. That's really up to you. So we've got all this great information. Why don't we try and put it all together using an example? So we'll kind of bounce back and forth between us here and we'll lay out this example for you guys. So Blake is planning on starting a family with their partner in about three years and they're aiming for an 18 month leave. They went through the numbers, they talked about it and their math is kind of as follows. Their fixed expenses, about $1,945 per month and the variable about $300 per month. They then use the $4,000 per year estimate to budget for the newborn. And since Blake is saving for 18 months, we'll multiply that by 1.5 because it'll be a year and a half. And that leaves us with $333.33 per month, um, which will round up eventually to make the math simple. If we divide that by two, because they're sharing their expenses with their partner, so we'll say that's about $170 to keep the math simple. And then for the RESP, we're just going to simply divide $208.33 for a monthly contribution. If you're wondering where that number comes from, go to the RESP post, and we're going to divide that by two again because they're sharing expenses. And just to round up, we'll say $105 uh, to keep the math simple again. So that means that Blake and their partner need $2,520 per month for their parental leave, and therefore need to save $45,000 $360 for the duration of the 18 months with a three-year timeline and factoring maybe a 1.25% interest rate in a high interest savings account they need to put away $1,245 per month to save enough to fund that parental leave the math is perfect now that's a lot of money to save every month it's it's a, it's a chunk of change 
Now, if you're feeling like, whoa, that's a little bit too much there, there are some options. You can either shorten your leave, you can use a hybrid model so you can bring in EI, you can lower your expenses, or you can increase your timeline that you have to save that money. Those are your options. So why don't we talk a little bit about that hybrid model because it's definitely something that it can be a very, very useful tool. There is a very good and detailed blog in terms of when is it beneficial to use EI in the long run versus not using EI and just straight up saving. We're not gonna go into that in this blog post. Make sure you check that one out. But in the meantime, let's check out that hybrid model. So self-employed healthcare professionals can participate in the EI program by registering with the Canadian Employment Insurance Commission and paying into these benefits. Now you will have to pay in for 12 months before you can utilize this, but it will give you access to parental benefits, sickness benefits, compassion care benefits, the family caregiver benefits for children and adults, and maybe more. Exactly, and there are multiple benefits within the parental benefits side of things, so stick with us here. Maternity benefits are only available to the person who is off work due to pregnancy or childbirth. These benefits cannot be shared between parents. They're available for a maximum of 15 weeks and provide up to 55% of your earnings to a maximum of $573 per week. Now, parental benefits are available to the parents of a newborn or newly adopted child and come in two options, which determine the number of weeks and the weekly amount that you'll receive. If there are two parents sharing the benefits, both must choose the same option, so either 12 or 18 months, but submit their application independently, and they can receive these benefits concurrently or one and after the other. These benefits are available for a maximum of 40 weeks total per couple, and one parent cannot receive more than 35 weeks of these benefits. And like the maternity benefit, they provide 55% of your earnings up to a maximum of $573 per week. If you're choosing the 12 month timeline, the extended parental benefits provide 33% of your earnings up to a maximum of $344 per week and are available for up to 69 weeks. But one parent cannot receive more than 61 weeks. Now, I, that's a mouthful, that's a lot to digest. Go check out that blog post if you want to know more about that. We know that that math is a lot, but for the purposes of an easy overview, EI will not cover the complete costs of a parental leave, but from our previous example, if we go back to the numbers, with EI, Blake would receive $26,832 over the 18 month leave. That would mean he would only have to save 18,500 of their own money over that same three year period, which would be another way to cut that monthly savings rate. And that cuts it down to just over $500, which is much more manageable. The caveat being, once you start paying into EI, you can never stop. That is the cliffhanger we will leave you with so that you go back and check out the previous post to see, is it worth it for EI versus is it not? Spoiler alert, it really depends on the number of kids you plan to have, but we'll leave it there. No, you got it, 100%. And Emma, to really be specific to your question as well, you were talking about business owners as well as clinicians. So, you know, business owners might have it a little bit better, potentially. If your business is well established, you might have a passive income stream there, potentially feeding you more income as you're on leave. So that might sweeten the pie a little bit as well. But this is really the brass tacks when it comes to maternity leave, parental leave, and EI. And like we said, we'll link to the posts in the show notes, we'll link to the financial toolkit, and we'll make sure that you have all the information you need to answer these questions better. Emma, it's always great to hear your voice. If you ever want to come back onto the podcast in person, we are we are eagerly waiting that. Yeah, the biggest downside of your, other than not having you here in person, I'm going to use quotation marks that they can't see because this is an audio podcast, in the room with us because it's all via Zoom, obviously, we can't boomerang when you send us a recording. So we need to do something in person again so we can we can pull out our boomerang skills. But thank you for submitting your question, Emma. Always, uh, always great to be able to support. And if you have a question for us, uh, you can submit it on the question period page. Again, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Or just find us on social on Instagram at allied.health.financial. Shoot us an email, info at alliedhealthfinancial.ca, and we'll get back to you as fast as we can. We love hearing from you guys. We look forward to having you back here next week. If you have any questions for us about this podcast or would like to suggest topics for future episodes, please use our contact page. You can also email us directly. 
Don't forget to rate and review this podcast and check the link in the description for the show notes. Thanks for listening.